We've been fighting a long time. We have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela. Welcome back, everybody. Steve with Suspidel. I'm coming at you with our second interview with Matthew, please, of A Catholic Life, 1 Peter 5. He probably writes for the USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, all that. He's, <laughs> he writes everywhere. You can't throw a dead cat without hitting his name somewhere. Matthew, welcome back. How you doing, man? Hey, I'm doing great. It's always good to be here. And just good before be I here. scandalize everybody in the world, he doesn't write for the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. Just, it's a joke. No. <laughs> Not not even the USA today. Not even the know? USA today. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we were going to talk about something that's coming up in a few weeks, fasting. Why mm -hmm. is that important? Um, <clears throat> he wrote a great article, Forgotten Customs of Septuagint Jason. You want to start out with there, and then we'll get into the uh, meat and potatoes. Yep. yep, yep, that's great. So, you know, right now we just started Septuagint Jason, the period of time for two and a half weeks before Lent starts, an ancient season going back um, well over a thousand years. And Septuagesima basically is a time for us to prepare for Lent. It's a time for us to mentally and physically prepare. It's a time that I recommend people start literally writing a Lenten plan. What is the three pillars of Lent? That's prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. So take a piece of paper out. What are prayers I'm planning to do in Lent? What's some additional fasting I'm gonna do beyond the requirement? And what's some way I'm going to do almsgiving? And I recommend filling that in <clears throat> and seeing, you know, asking yourself in the next few weeks, what sacrifices can you make? And if we look to our ancestors and the customs that I wrote about in that article, we'll see that, um, well, firstly, fasting was in some places done during Septuagesima as a pious practice, not because it was legally required, but we're about to embark on a serious fasting regimen. So before you begin something like that, it makes sense to practice. So some people I know, I, I recommend it to them, try fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays in Septuagesima, just to ease yourself up and get used to it. Um, that That's not legally required, that's more, it's a pious custom, offer it as penance. Um, same thing with, you know, uh, with that pious custom of fasting, we're getting ready to do uh, abstinence in Lent. And Lent and abstinence, as we will talk about today, was very strict. So to that end, Fat Tuesday, for those of us who are going to observe a true Lenten fast, can have some celebration. That's why we have in, in England is Pancake Tuesday, where they would you know use up all their pancakes. Here in Chicago, it's the big Potsky Day. I don't know anybody else who eats them, but every year I go out for them. I have them delivered sometimes. Huh. Like the builder of my home last year, he's Polish. He had Potskis delivered to my front door as a as a thank you gift for buying a house a couple of weeks beforehand. So, uh, I mean, I always look forward to it. And um, it is, for some of us, the last hurrah, the, the carnival day, the literally from, from Latin, um, the farewell to the meat, the farewell we will learn as well to all animal products and dairy. So, yeah, I went to the butcher the, the other day, and, and my thought was, well, this is the last time I'm coming here for a month and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, after after yesterday, I mean, for those of us who, who went to the traditional mass, the priest all of a sudden goes up to the altar in, in violent vestments. And we hear in the intro, the sorrows of death have surrounded me. Like, I mean, just last week we heard about the angels praising God and we heard about the divinity of Christ for several weeks after Epiphany. Now all of a sudden death and it feels a little bit jarring, but you need that. I feel like that. Um, and the church has too that buffer zone. Because you don't want to go straight from Easter, Epiphany, Tide, right into Lent. You have to have that preparation, you know, with anything before you embark on a mission, a journey or something. You're going to prepare. You're going to make some lists. You're going to think about what you're going to do, what you're going to pack. That's what this time is. What are we going to do? Because Great Lent is the very badge of Christian honor, as Pope Benedict the Fourteenth said. Yeah, now you got the modern, uh, the new calendar. You go from basically the, uh, we're going to the deep end. You go from off the land into the deep end. Good luck. 
ready to roll. His <laughs> a father made a sermon. Uh, uh, he, the parish I go to is nice, and he does both rites. And he goes, I, you know, from the Novus Ordo guys, I get to the second week, and they're still coming up to me going, Father, I, f- I haven't figured out what to do yet. He goes, you, that's the genius of the church and stuff to adjacent was yeah. like, hey, get your mind ready. And in sports, <laughs> get your mind right. And, and as we'll see, if you actually study the history of the Lenten fast, like I want to get into today, uh, um, you talk about going to the deep end. I mean, m- my argument is it's unbelievably shallow. You're only fasting hard, hardly at all, and you're doing very little. And, and as I would argue, even if you go back and you rewind, rewind the clock to 1962, that is actually very easy. Even 1915, yeah. you know, yeah. the time of Pius the Tenth, we're talking about very easy compared to our ancestors. So there is a problem, I feel like, in the traditional circle where some people simply say the 1970 code is the end all be all. This is the epitome of tradition. This was as great as it got, and it went down there from here. That is not the case. And it's simply also not the case of, well, my grandmother said she did this. That must be what traditional Catholicism is because she remembers it, or she didn't remember it. They didn't do it because grandma would do it. And as, as I'd like to show today, fasting has changed a lot, and it's in a bad way over the past couple centuries especially. So what grandma's recollection is, maybe it's harder than what you're used to, is not the epitome of tradition, of what the apostles or our ancestors in the faith set out when they instituted the fast. Matthew, are you telling me just giving up a Hershey bar is not enough? <laughs> um, no, no. Giving up Hershey bar is not enough. I don't think... I mean, even the people who, you know, live heroic lives and they really don't have any sins to make up, surely they would make up the sins of others and they would do more. I got some safe books around here. I guarantee I'm going to flip it open to like St. John and say, I gave up Hershey. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I like Almond Joy more, so maybe maybe that's what I would (laughs) Well, yeah, you bring up stuff to adjacent and uh, Garanger talks about the burial of the Alleluia. In a tremendous, mm-hmm. you, you talk about how fasting's changed. He brought up how just the liturgy, I guess you could say, for that went from glorious mm-hmm. to uh, basically we're burying it. Have a great day. Exactly, exactly. If you look at like the Mozarabic rite, uh-huh. the elaborate hymns they would have in, in the service for first vespers of Septuagesima, and that nowadays it's reduced to just simply a few extra words right before the final. Um, the end of it and that's it and then where it's gone yeah it's so. glorious what the way garanger write, writes about this just makes <laughs> you feel why it's one of those anger things why have and i been told about this before because mm-hmm. you say it all the time hallelujah hallelujah, hallelujah. It's, it's almost like oh yeah great hallelujah we don't hear it anymore the way he mm-hmm. writes about it should give you a bigger devotion to that word absolutely and for those of us who say the divine office Often, I mean, you're just so accustomed to it. I found myself this morning almost saying it, and then if you, if you, I mean, you're like jawing, like, oh no, I don't want to, I don't want to say that. I can't say that. So it's just, it's a little bit like, oh, I almost did something wrong. And um, you know, there was a custom, at least in some monasteries, when they would say the divine office. Whenever they would make a mistake, they would genuflect, mm-hmm. and you see that sometimes. So if they say something wrong, they said the wrong antiphon, they said that word, and when they wouldn't, shouldn't have, and so you would see, especially younger monks, the novices, genuflecting often so much so that I know somebody was like, why do the monks genuflect so much during the divine office? And it was like, oh, he's just a young monk. He's messing up all the time. They so miss one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's just, he just taking care of it right now. So, yeah, that's, that's another custom, too. But no, I... It's a good that uh, step to a Jesima is a season in and of itself. So I wrote about some of those customs. It's great if you could incorporate some of those into your life. I mean, and just try to be present. Stop. I mean, look forward to Lent, prepare, but treat the season for what it is. It is a time to focus on, like this week, we're reading about Adam and Eve and, and the original sin. We're going to be reading about Noah. So read the Matins readings, reflect on sin, the consequences of sin, the whole reason why Christ had to be born, the whole reason we have concupiscence and the effects of original sin from death and disease and war and everything affecting us now is because of that. So understanding the why is very important. And I think that's a good transition into 
talking about Lent and fasting, the why, because we can get into a lot of specifics on here's the history of fasting. And I think that's very important to tell because very, very few people know that and talk about that. But it's important to remember that the reason we fast goes back to the Garden of Eden, because the, one of the first commands ever given to mankind was, you know, our first parents were told to fast from the fruit of the tree of knowledge, good and evil. Their first command was to fast. And we know they didn't. We know the first sin was pride, but the second sin was gluttony. The second sin of mankind was gluttony. So fasting helps repair what mankind has always been suffering from. And if we look at Elijah, if we look at Moses, if we look at the life of our Lord, all of them fasted. And the church fathers, uh, the church and the catechism, I mean, the early fathers, everybody said that the purpose of fasting was to cleanse the soul, to do penance, subjecting the flesh, quenching lust, uh, kindling chastity, protecting against demons. All of those are reasons why we fast. We don't fast to lose weight. We don't fast to, um, you know, like St. Paul talked about yesterday, running the race. You know, like we don't fast because an athlete fasts because they want to get better at something. It's not that. It's not for vanity. It is a means to an end, not the end in and of itself. Like St. Leo the Great said, what we forego by fasting, we give to the poor. So it's also not a time to be like, I want to save some money. Let's eat more simply. And I can have a lot more money this month because the money you're saving from ideally eating much less and less simply should be part of your almsgiving. So that's important. I think the purpose, just make sure like, you keep that in mind. That's the purpose. These are the goals and objectives. It's a means to that end to undo the sins of man. I remember, I think my brother used to say it. I don't know if he got it from someone else, but it was fasting without prayer. <laughs> it's just dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard that too. And it then you, you talk about this week since uh, Garen Jay's reading. If you read that, you talk about why. It's not just reading it going, yeah, you know, she you know, had the serpent talk to her. She ate the apple. He goes into it. They had one job. They were nothing 10 minutes ago. He asked him not to do the simple text. She, he, she listens to this blasphemy, sacrilegious words, and she communicates with the thing. Yeah. It really gets digging deep, like how bad this was at the beginning. Mm hmm. Okay, so yeah, go. All right. Sorry. Sorry yeah. to interrupt on that one. Go, go no, that's on. good. I mean, it just, if you think about that, 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 that just so important, like, to fast, to master your own passions, to be hungry and say, no, I don't need that. I know I don't need that to survive. And I will suffer the consequences that I'm physically feeling. And I will offer it up for souls and a reparation for sin. And people have been doing this for, for thousands of years. Like by doing this, this I think is so important to recover traditional fasting because our ancestors did this. Not only do we need to rediscover prayer, and rediscover the mass and the liturgy. We must rediscover fasting. You can't simply say we have the, the traditional mass, we're fine, and we don't fast at all, and we don't observe practices. No, I, I strongly believe fasting goes hand in hand with recovering true Catholic civilization. So that's a good point. It's not just the mass part, and we go into the smells and bells and hearing the language. Are you listening to the scriptures? Are you doing what they're saying? Are you doing the actual practices that involves everything else around? It's not just one thing. It's the whole king caboodle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's everything. It's the theology. It's it's not just going to mass or the traditional mass. It has to be more. It has to embody your life. But like you, like fasting. yourself, you, you do the divine office. I preach, I'm pretty sure you sing the Marian antiphons at, at, at the end of the night or before you go to bed. It's incorporates everything you do during the day is revolved around the liturgy. Even if you're not at the liturgy, you're doing mm -hmm. it in your daily life. Mm -hmm. Because because all time belongs to God. Uh -huh. He created time. Time belongs to him. We simply sanctify time by participating in the liturgy that is occurring right now in heaven. Then that never ends. And thus, there is no fasting in, he in heaven. But we who are on our journey to hopefully get there, we have to fast. Our Lord required it. He said that when the bridegroom left, you, you will fast then. And as we'll see, so if we start with a little bit of history of fasting, the, the Lenten fast, so there's many different traditional fasts. We've talked about St. Martin's Lent. Mm -hmm. um, there's the Assumption fast. There's the Apostles fast. 
There was the weekly fast on Wednesdays and Fridays and in some places Saturdays. But when we talk about Lent, Great Lent, the greatest fast of the church, that was established by the apostles themselves. It's not often taught anymore, but it's affirmed by St. Jerome, St. Leo the Great, St. Cyril of Alexandria. If you look at some old catechisms, the, the Dom Geringer as well says that the Lenten fast was established by the apostles. And it was primarily started as a means for catechumens to prepare for their baptism, and we know that. And the universal aspect of the fast of all the baptized participating in it really only occurred early on in Holy Week. So you have the catechumens preparing for their baptism and the faithful would join them at Holy Week in, in the fast. And then it would terminate with the celebration of the Lord's resurrection. But that quickly turned into joining the catechumens for all the period of time leading up to, to Easter. And so by 339 AD, St. Athanasius said Lent is a 40-day fast that, quote, the whole world observed. So, of course, he means the whole Christian world. That's 339. And if we look at how the fast was observed, um, it was always one meal. So people always ask me, what is a true what is a true fast? Is that just bread and water? And I, and I don't know why people always go to that. That is not what a true fast was. And um Although the definition of fasting has changed over time, the fast was generally one meal. It was not had until after sunset. And the fast would start again after midnight. So after the sun went down, you had your one meal and, and you would not eat again, therefore, until the following night, your one meal. That form lasted until the ninth century. So we're talking about hundreds of years of the same practice in, in the faith that our forefathers did in the early church fathers, and it was practiced widely. By the early Middle Ages, around the time of St. Gregory the Great, around the beginning of the seventh century, we have the fast beginning on Ash Wednesday. Now, those of us who have read a bit about hi, uh, church history, we know it wasn't called Ash Wednesday until about the year 1099. That day was simply known as the beginning of the fast, the day we call Ash Wednesday now was just known as that's the day the fast begins because we know fasting was not practiced on Sunday. So in order to have exactly 40 days of fasting, it was it was begun on what is Ash Wednesday. So you would have 40 days. Now, <clears throat> what form that took as well with abstinence, we, we have a written record of this. So around the year 604, we have documents that say, we have seen from flesh meat and from all things that come from flesh as milk, cheese, and eggs. So it might be surprising, I feel like, to many modern Catholics to think milk, cheese, eggs, and all flesh was prohibited throughout Lent. So that's one of my big things that I want to focus on is how the Lenten abstinence has changed. The days of fasting were always days of abstinence as well. So now you could be like, I'm fasting, but I'm not abstaining. There's, there's some distinction on that. If it's a fast day, it's always an abstinence day. If it's an absence day throughout the year, it might not necessarily be a fast day. So something to keep in mind, there was a additional um, distinction for Holy Saturday where the fasting was kept until midnight, until the beginning of the resurrection. And, and that, that was what it was practiced in the early Middle Ages. It was not really until around the year 817, we begin to see things change. So around that time, the meal that was always had after sunset had begun to move up. And by now, is had at about three o'clock in the afternoon. And St. Thomas Aquinas mentions this too, how that was an appropriate time since our Lord died on the cross at three o'clock. Um, it really, um, it, it probably moved up for more practical reasons than that, because if, if we also know around the year 817, that's when collations were introduced. So the modern notion of a fast is one large meal and two small meals. You've heard that before. It's just horrible. It just I, I, that's the worst description. I'll never use that one again. Because <laughs> meal what's has, large is yeah, it meal the yeah, exactly. <laughs> what's large, what's small, what makes it a meal? Is it head of the table? Like how long does a meal last? I just don't like yeah. don't like that that expression at all. So I like to use more technicalities. Collation is what it was called. That was what you would have in the evening. And it was introduced because monks would be getting, they would be working in the fields despite it being Lent, and they would become very tired, exhausted by the end of the day. So they were allowed a small morsel of bread and a drink in the evening uh, on a fasting day, in addition to having eaten at three o'clock. 
And that's a collation. And it started for monks, but it became universal for all the faithful. So that started, again, around the beginning of the 800s. So at the time of St. Thomas Aquinas, around the high Middle Ages, we have a fast that is Monday through Saturdays. Food is eaten around 3 o'clock, and an evening collation is allowed. Of course, you don't have to have the collation, but it's allowed, and I'm sure most people did. No animal products are consumed during Lent. Abstinence remained on Sundays. So a notion that I often have to point out to people, and I will gladly, I wrote an article on it too before, how abstinence on Sundays in Lent remained for centuries, up until relatively recent times. People think like, oh, it's Sunday, you can't fast. There was no fasting on Sundays. But that's not the same as abstinence. They are different things. That's one of the reasons why Easter eggs are such a big deal. We celebrate, we finally have eggs again. We finally have the foods that we had on Carnival, on Fat Tuesday. We used up our butter, our milk, and eggs. We won't have them again until Easter. So you see that in the writings of the Middle Ages, and St. Thomas affirms that. If possible, no food was had on Ash Wednesday or Good Friday. So if you could, eat absolutely nothing at all those two days. And Holy Week itself was a more strict fast. Only bread, salt, water, and herbs. And that's all there was. And so if we look at that, that is that is a true fast. Think about that. Think about how hard that would be. That is that is not a um, something to take lightly, but that is something that the faithful willingly and joyously practiced in reparation for sin. But by the time of the Renaissance, we really start to see things beginning to, to unravel in, in fasting. So by the fourth century, the meal was moved up to 12 o'clock. So again, it was mid, it was it was after sunset, then three o'clock. Well, we're, we're hungry earlier. Let's eat at noon. And that's why we call it noon. You've heard that, why 12 p.m. is called noon, because the monks would pray the office of noon before they ate their meal. And it simply became known as noon because they would have it at that time. The collation remained allowed at night. So even though the meal was moved up, you could still have the collation at night. And then by the time of the Protestant revolt, we see um, many of those nations that became Protestant um, began to take action against the fast. Because beforehand, this was not just civil law. This was, I mean, this was not just church law. This was civil law. You were not allowed to serve and eat meat uh, on Fridays, you know, or, or throughout Lent. And we see it as well, like in, in England, after King James II, so after 1688, um, the laws in England were officially still on the books to prohibit uh, meat, but they were never enforced, and they were finally removed in 1863. But they were part of the civil law for a long time. And here in America, we have, we have no idea that you would actually, you know, legislate something like that um but by the 1700s we have what i feel like is the most significant change to lenten fasting and that was on may 31st of 1741 pope benedict the 14th he officially permitted meat to be had at the main meal during lent on sundays uh, no fish and flesh meat were allowed to be had at the same meal but this is the first time we have during lent you may have meat uh, but he was very strict on you can't have fish and meat at the same meal. Again, something that most people have no no idea about. I, it was no only after, turf. It, no, I, absolutely no surf and turf. I see McDonald's is advertising surf and turf now on, on their windows. Benedict the Fourteenth would have no not allow those those ads to be coming. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the thing is, he actually wrote, and, and it's a wonderful document you can read. And and, and he wrote about how important it was though to keep the Lenten fast, how it was a badge of honor and how would we, you know, help avert the wrath of God by the Lenten fast. And it's a wonderful passage. I'm, I recently wrote an article, like some of the things I'm summarizing here today, there's an article on, on the A Catholic Life blog that I just recently wrote on the history of the Lenten fast. That goes into this in more detail. And at the top, there's a picture of him and some of what he wrote. And that, that's well worth reading and meditating on. Yeah, yeah. But, I made that meme, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw it in, back in the day when I was trying to make, uh, hey, what can I do? And uh, I made mm. that through uh, Photoscape. And uh, oh, wow. everyone's, I don't care about the credit, but yeah, that was what, that one. Well, how appropriate. Uh, We're talking about that today. No, yeah, yeah. No, it's great that you put it up there. I saw that. There it is. 
Yeah, yeah, it's great. So, I mean, what he said, even though he introduced this novelty in the Latin past, I think it's so important that yes. it is the badge of Christian honor. And unfortunately, I think if you we look at what historically happened, that kind of opened the floodgates, I would say. So we had some changes occur. It was slow over the centuries, but then, you know, by the time we go to the time of Leo the 13th in 1886, he openly allowed meat, eggs, and milk on Sundays of Lent, and on the main meal, weekdays of Lent, except Wednesdays and Fridays, at least in the U.S. Holy Saturday remained a separate matter. He also introduced another novelty where a frustulum was allowed. The frustulum is what we would consider the other small meal, not a meal. It was a frustulum. It was a small piece, basically, he said, of bread or coffee or tea or chocolate that, that you could have. So you can have your coffee, tea, chocolate, bread, something, something like that in the morning. Um, but no butter was allowed, um, generally. Um, eggs and um, milk products were also allowed in the evening collation. So Leo, the, and that was per Leo the 13th. So he began to introduce uh, a number of different changes. Um, he also allowed lard and cooking for the first time. So we have more introduction of animal products, dairy products, meat derivatives before than ever before. And this was only around the end of the 1800s. Uh -huh. So we've covered well more than a thousand years where, where this was a complete novelty. But by the time of 1884 and the third plenary council of Baltimore, um, we could even read, and that article I, I wrote, it talks a little bit about it. There was actually ounce guidelines on fasting day, how many ounces your pustulum could be, how many ounces should your collation be. So did the thought of the meal being subjective it is actually not what the church had taught for a long time. There were guidelines. Um, we didn't talk about it, but as a separate matter, the fasting on Christmas Eve um, you would permit and had permitted for centuries a double collation because it was called the joyful fast. So if it's a double collation, what's a regular collation? It's about eight ounces. So the frustulum is about two ounces. The collation would be about eight ounces. Milk was allowed in the U.S. at the collation, but not universally. Like in Ireland, it was not allowed. So if you look at and study fasting history and abstinence history, as I tried to do the past couple of years to try to get more and more people understanding what we had lost and to rediscover it, we see there were always regional distinctions. Um, but by the time of the end of the 1800s, like I'm talking about with Leo the 13th, we have more and more sort of exceptions and indults. We have the working men's privilege introduced in 1895, which applied to them and their families. And you could read the article about how the specifics of that. I won't get into that here. But basically we come to a huge milestone in the road and that was the 1917 Code of Canon Law. So people always put it up as that's the epitome of tradition. Uh -huh. And it's not. Because basically what it said, and I'm only going to talk about it in terms of the Lenten fast. It covers other fasts too. And that's beyond the scope in our time today. But uh, partial abstinence was practiced on Mondays through Thursdays. Full abstinence was practiced on Fridays and Saturdays. Sunday there was, there was nothing. Um, Eggs and milk products became universally permitted. That was the first time they became universally permitted during Lent. Um, but there still remained 40 fasting days. Mondays through Saturdays were fasting days. But, you know, if we know the 1917 code begun under uh, St. Pius X, finished under Benedict XV, I feel like it was hardly published at all because, uh, before Benedict XV then issued um, another permission where he said Saturday abstinence in Lent could be transferred to any other day except Fridays and Ash Wednesday. And most of these are, he's giving permission to bishops to, to do and, and to legislate this matter, not like you or I, not telling us, you know, what day you want. So like in America, by 1919, the U.S. transferred Saturday Lent and abstinence often to Wednesdays. And this permission was renewed as needed up until 1931. And then at that point, individual bishops had it requested. It wasn't just the U.S., as a whole. Pius XII, great and many things that he did, uh, but he furthered the weakening of, of Lenten discipline. In 1941, he dispensed fast and abstinence. He said bishops may dispense fast and abstinence on any day except Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, the Vigil of the Assumption, and Christmas Eve, and Friday absence had to remain. And that in itself was a 
If a bishop chose to do that, that is a small remnant of the 1917 code, much less the days beforehand. And I haven't even talked about how the 1917 code reduced the number of holy days of obligation to more than 30 to eight. It was so low, they, they added two back right away afterwards. It was so bad. So, um, of course, bad is my opinion. I think it just weakened discipline. And yeah. you can grant dispensation for people, but when you universally, as you'll see with Lent, university to say, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. Nobody cares anymore. Yeah. And then in the last change, 1956, this is the last change from Vatican II, um, Holy Saturday changes from a day of complete to partial abstinence. So then what, what are we left with? So if you're in 1962 and you want to observe the Lenten fast, you you know fast 40 days, but you, you think milk and eggs are fine and partial absence is okay Mondays through Thursdays. And that's not what our forefathers did. That's not what was done for thousands of years. And your meal could be had any time afternoon when in fact, if we look at what Muslims do fasting after sunset, I mean, the ones that, so the Lenten fast I try to observe and that I try to encourage rivals much of their fasting. And while they certainly, um, I definitely heard some before ridicule Catholics for our fasting, you know, when you fast two days a year and it's basically eat a meal and two small meals, it's not fasting. And complain about um, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but, but when they see like a true Catholic fast, I mean, they're like, wow, that's hard. That's like a marathon. That's not the sun goes down and I'm partying and I can eat whatever I want, uh, anything, and as much as I want until the sun goes up. No, I mean, the sun goes down, I eat a dish. It's primarily bread and vegetables. And then I don't eat again until the following night. I may permit myself a, you know, a collation, but, but that was it. So in my article at the very end, I give some recommendations for what I think if somebody wants to voluntarily take on a traditional Lenten fast using some of the principles that our ancestors and our forefathers observed, um, I kind of outline that there. And it's very similar to what St. Thomas Aquinas uh, would have observed. Um, of course, it doesn't bind under sin. It doesn't mean that um, you know people who aren't doing it are wrong, but I mean, I think it's something to aspire to. I did not do this strict of a fast for a while. I eased myself into it. Uh -huh. Eventually, as of a few years ago, I began the Holy Week part too of only bread, herbs, water, but I also added coffee, and that that was that was it. And then um, I look forward to it every year. It is a it is a struggle. It is a marathon. Um, I also run marathons, so maybe that's why I like it. But um, it, it is really it's a challenge. It is really something. It's a know? challenge. Guys accept yeah. the challenge, so it's a challenge. It's it way is. to better yourself. Yes, yes, because remember the purpose is I'm not only subjecting my body, I'm becoming a master. I'm you know quenching lust, I'm increasing myself in virtue, I'm making reparation for sins. Uh, Lent has been called the tithe of the year. This is the time God is owed, and there's no better time to do this than before we celebrate the greatest uh, ho holy day, Easter, in the whole year. And the apostles established this fa uh, fast for this reason. And if we look to the East, what the Byzantine Catholics do, they observe it with some degrees of strictness as well, although it uh, has been over the past, you know, some decades, a little bit more uh, recommended than observed. But like their equivalent of Septuagesima, they're already giving up things like meat one week and then cheese and easing themselves into it that way. Um, our tradition is a little bit different, but to rediscover traditional fasting um, is so important to rediscovering and reestablishing the rule of Christ uh, in his kingdom and, and the church. I feel like those of us who are observing this and offering it for souls, reparation for sin, for, for the exaltation of church against her enemies, especially her enemies from within, it, it will be extremely meritorious. And um, there's there's great recipes out there. Look up vegan recipes and try it out. Try it out with your families. Um, you, you know, you can, I would say, traditionally the, Lent, the, the fast began at age 21 and terminated at age 60. Maybe the only thing that I like is um, from, from the changes after Vatican II, that was lowered to 18. So 18 to 60 observes the fast. I feel like if you can sin, you can fast. So I don't view anything wrong with children fasting. If your children want to join you, 
please have them. I think that's a great thing to do. And um, I mean, abstinence, I, I feel like even though there's an age for abstinence as well, I feel like everybody should be observing abstinence. And I strongly believe it, there should be no milk. There should be no eggs. There should be no cheese. There should be no butter. Um, actually, the early church as well, and we see this in the in the Eastern rites, they didn't use olive oil either. Um, so that, that was something taken out as well. So, um, and another thing I, I didn't mention that I think is really interesting is, you know, maybe you know the answer. Who was the first person to ever eat meat in recorded history? Do you know that? Ronald McDonald? <laughs> no, I'm not, no, I, I don't know that one. <laughs> Noah? Noah. It was Noah. Was Noah. Yeah. It was Noah. Yeah. He was the first one to ever eat yeah, meat. Sacrifice so. after New York. Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, I, I read before some, I, I don't know if it was the saying or church father, so they, they mentioned how to take away meat in its entirety is to reduce man back beforehand. You know, we are trying to, remember, go back to the garden. We're trying to make up for the sin of Adam and Eve. We're trying to make up for all sins. The first sin was eating, eating what they should not have eaten. And their second, and that led to gluttony. And what do we do? We, we take away all the consolation God's afford us. We take away, I mean, some early on in the early church, wine was not permitted either. So no alcohol as well. Um, no, no meat, nothing. Let's go back to primitive eating because we are sinners. Um, if you observe Lent that way, I think that that really is a badge of honor. You know, like, wow, I did that. I mean, not me. God did it through me. He allowed me to do that because that's hard. If you start and you... And, you know, like, okay, Pat Tuesday, I'm celebrating. I, I'm not having a day of debauchery, but it's a day of um, eating things I like, pastries and pancakes and some dessert, having a drink and pizza and all that. That sounds great. And, and, and burgers and whatever. Uh, but it's also a day to honor the holy face and to make reparation uh, because our Lord specifically asked for reparation that day for sins, uh, for the excess of carnival in an apparition of his in the 1900s. Um, so we should be doing that too. It's a day of prayer too. It's not just a day of celebration, but it is a last hurrah. It's the farewell to meet is carnival. And then all of a sudden Ash Wednesday, you have ashes on your head. Ideally eat nothing at all. Eat nothing until Thursday at sunset, if possible. I mean, I'm talking about ideals here. That's not easy. That's something that with God's grace, you may be able to do. Um, but that's not just like, oh, sure. I'll do a little extra penance. No, that's serious penance. And, and and that and that is what some people need, um, and what the church definitely needs people doing that for sure. Yeah. If you look at what some monks do, you know they observe the monastic fast, mm -hmm. and the monastic fast began last September, around the time of the exaltation of the Holy Cross. They have basically been fasting all this time, and we are only going to be meeting up with them at, at Lent to continue the fast that terminates for them at Easter. Think about all those consecrated souls out there all the time fasting on our behalf. This is our chance to join them. This is our chance to really do something, you know, to subject ourselves to, to make up for sin, to, to give honor to God. Everybody knows the church needs it. Souls need it. The world is bad. Morality is falling apart. Fasting's purpose, one of the one of the main ones is to quench lust and to bridle uh, the flesh. I mean, our world needs fasting. So many people are, I feel like, very timid to recommend fasting or I don't want to, I don't know your medical conditions. I'm, I'm not going to recommend it or, uh, I mean, everybody knows what they can and cannot do. So if somebody can do fasting, I think they should. And if you can observe the traditional way. Of course, the church doesn't require people who, you know, have severe diabetes or something like that to fast, never has for medical conditions. I will say, though, that I have seen uh, in practice, some people generally thought they weren't able to for health reasons. And it was actually just their diet. Their diet was so full of processed foods. They felt so bad when they didn't have the, the sugars. And to, to break away from that and to cleanse themselves they they be, they felt better and they realized they didn't have diabetes they didn't have you know hypoglycemia or something it just they had a bad diet and Len actually forced them out of that into a good diet a diet back to bread and vegetables and 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 not processed foods so if you're thinking I don't know this for me it's hard and you know if I don't even eat lunch I get I, you know I I feel ill remember you can have water water throughout the day 
I, I know people in, in Europe who often complain about Americans and for one reason or the other. But one of the common complaints I hear is Americans just always eat. You feel something, you might be hungry, so you eat. They're like, drink water. You know, you don't need to eat that much. And you really don't. You realize that the body doesn't need that much food. Remember, our Lord did it. Our Lord was fully human. So did Moses. So did Elijah. It wasn't like just, um, you know, making this up in the Middle Ages. This has been done for a long time. We have lay people for thousands of years observing this fast. Uh, and they did so gladly. So what that's can a, we do for That's a key one to gladly, joyfully. Don't be, yes. you know, they don't want it. You don't want your sad face. Oh, that guy looks like he's fasting. Be happy yes. about it. Right, right. And, and our Lord said not to go around and we don't want to go around and be like, you know, go to the parish and be like, none of you guys observe the real lunch and fast. I do. I'm so much better. I mean, that's not what, that's not what I advocate at all. That's that right there is the publican and the Pharisee. And we don't want that. We, we fast because we know it's honor to God. We know it's what the church required for a long time, and we want to do what our ancestors and forefathers did. And we would like to encourage others to do so, too, just like we encourage others to pray the rosary. We encourage others to give alms, to, to practice virtue. It, it doesn't mean we're being pharisaical. That's often thrown out, you know, by simply observing an older thing. That's not it at all. Um, we can and should encourage other people to do it. We should not pat ourselves on the back. And we have to remember, and, and Lent is a great time for that, to pray often because fasting must be accompanied with prayer. So as I talked about at the beginning, Septuagesima, what is the prayer, fasting, and almsgiving you're going to do during Lent? It's great to do these Lenten fast and, and with this strictness. But if your prayer column is, is empty and your almsgiving column is empty, you're missing two legs of the three-legged stool. You need them all. You know, you, it, it, it can, you can't just focus on fasting. It's a diet. And, and we also don't want to be uncharitable to others. We want to make sure that we restrain our emotions, that, you know, what, what I often hear people say, like, what are you going to give up for Lent? You hear it too. You know, the Hershey bar or, or whatever it is. Coke. What you give up for Lent? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's more than giving something up. And, and, and that aside, um, even even with the strict Lenten fast, plenty of people also gave up other things voluntarily, too, uh -huh. despite how, how strict this was. Um, but it's more than giving something up. you got to replace it. You know, if you're not saying the rosary every day, that's a great one. Do Stations of the Cross on Fridays. Say more indulged prayers. I encourage people to uh, read uh, a book, spiritual reading during Lent. I think that was actually in the rule of St. Benedict. One of his recommendations during to Lent was a monk must read a spiritual book through. So you have 40 days to do that. Uh, visiting a cemetery, um, visiting um, people who are sick. There's so many ways we can be living out these acts of mercy. And if you look at the church's tradition, like on Holy Thursday, that was what the faithful were encouraged to do. They were encouraged to spend their days in, in pious activities and, and share it with the poor and throughout all of Lent too. So if you're looking for um, things to do in prayer, there's so much there. Um, there's going plenty to do. Masses. Yeah, there's plenty to do. And same thing with almsgiving. I mean, yeah. There are traditional Catholic orders that need our support. There are monks and nuns that depend on us. There are charities, you know, for the pro-life cause that depend on us. This is a great time of year to be like, I'm saving money because I'm not going out to restaurants. I, I'm eating less. That's where the funds are going to go. Not in my pocket. They're going to go to others who, who, you know, can use them. And at the same time, the Lenten fast as well um necessitated like no parties it doesn't matter if i eat or not it would be inappropriate to throw a party yeah. i mean you just there's certain things you just don't do you don't go out you know on the town and do something no i have to wait till lent's over lent is a fast of the mind as well and the will it is penance and if i'm not just doing the lenten fast i'm also trying to force all these other things out i have more time for prayer i'm not eating as much I'm, I'm not going out. People want to hang out and go out for drinks. I don't do that during Lent, you know. So I have plenty of time to say the whole rosary, all 15 decades. I have time to maybe go to an extra mass throughout the week or, or even every day, depending where you live. There's just so much to do. And I just really, really, really hope that people take Lent seriously because I always believed it really was the badge of Christian honor. Before um, 
I was Catholic because uh, my family became Catholic when I was in high school. The one thing that really drew me was Lent. Mm -hmm. There were all these people out there who were giving up something together. It must be a unified cause. It must be something important. For me, that was so important and such a draw. And I see that with other people. This is a great missionary opportunity. People are like, oh, why can't you eat this? Why can't you eat these meatballs? Why can't you do this? Oh, I'll tell you why. And it's not because I'm forced to. And I would love to devour all and, these, but. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I would love to, but I choose not to, you know. Yeah, it's a good evangelization. Yeah. It's a good catechetical thing. Uh, it's the great, yeah. uh, you mentioned it tough. It is that the great line from League of, Alone, uh, League of Their Own. It's supposed to be tough. The tough makes mm -hmm. it great. Mm -hmm. It goes back into manliness. We want mm -hmm. the tough thing. Iron fire and sharpens iron type deal. The challenge. Now, if you yes. haven't done this ever before in your life, it may burn you out if you try to go all in on the first couple of weeks. Gradually build yeah. yourself up to it, as Matthew said, beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is something that you should definitely take to prayer and think about what additional fasting can I do? And it is not giving up one thing or, or two things. What of these can you incorporate? Some people I know just, uh, they'll, you know, maybe a way to ease in is no meat during Lent, fasting every day but Sundays. And that's a good way to ease in. I'm not going to do the, some people will be like, I'm not going to do the extra Holy Week fast of only bread, salt, or I'm not going to do that. My meal I'll have it sometime in the evening, might not necessarily be after sunset, that's fine. There's ways to to observe Lent um, without exact those specifications, but it, it, it all goes back to the purpose, uh -huh. you know, and we have the right reason. Are we really trying to do it to save souls and, and, and for our family? And, and um, remember a great line course, by just... a priest. I'm sorry. I remember <laughs> well, a great line by a priest saying, uh, you say you love God. Now it's time to prove it. Time to show it yeah. to him. Yes, now is the time. You know, we show him that how much we love him by keeping his commandments. Mm -hmm. And remember, to observe the laws of fasting and abstinence is a precept of the church. It is a commandment. And um, in my role as um, as a writer for catechismclass.com, we have a course on the precepts. So basically, everything I talked about, about the Lent and fast, is actually only one part of one of the precepts so i mean there's so much out there on, on the precepts but the course on that i offer on the precepts might be really good if somebody wants to go into this in more detail because we didn't have time to talk about the other fast too um i also put out this year a calendar that i if somebody really wants to observe traditional fasting and abstinence throughout the whole year not just lent i put out a calendar and um there are there are hundreds i mean there's definitely more than a hundred days in the year for fasting. So uh, again, that might be like a goal, something I aspire to, um, not something you have to do, but it's something I think that people can do. I they noticed want to. you had made a good point about the uh, processed foods and such. You know, secular people they talk about fasting all the time nowadays because of this. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know, mentioned about bread. I was talking to my wife about this. You know, you look at how you made real bread, the good stuff, not the mm -hmm. processed ones now that makes people sick. These guys mm -hmm. lift off good bread from the beginning. So maybe if we make our own bread, go get you a good old school uh, uh, cooking book on how to make some good real bread. Maybe mm -hmm. that will help you out there in the land too if you try to do that option instead of like a sun, whatever. Uh, to go yeah. to the local bilo and get the you know thin sliced. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if you really want to, there's there's ways to make bread without dairy products. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make vegan bread, that's good. If people want it, you know, sometimes people ask me what I often eat because I do aspire to this Lenten fast. I eat um, uh, Italian food I feel like is very good for vegan, vegetarian, depending on, on the pasta and all. Um, plenty of vegetables. Um, Mediterranean food can be good. Indian food can be very good. That's often prepared uh, vegan. So that's kind of what I what I stay to, um, but there's just nothing like waiting until you hear the message of the resurrection on Easter and finally going out for a sandwich. I was in Rome one year uh, and I, after a mass uh, uh, on Holy Saturday night uh, for um, at the Ephesus P Church, I went out and had a porchetta sandwich. First time I hadn't eaten in a long time. And it's just the most special thing. And 
it, it, you don't really know how great it, it is until you're like, wow, I'm, I'm actually having meat. And it's kind of like, oh, am I should be having this? Like, kind of like, you know, praying hallelujah during, you know, septuagesima. Like, They've, oh, no, I messed up. Oh, did I eat something wrong? And put, a, be put, a, 20, like put a 20 around the side and just look at it and say, that's for after he's talking getting me a steak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and mean, there's some years like, Wendy's is open late. I would stop at Wendy's Easter very, very late and get a sandwich. You know, first time I had meat in a long time. There's something special about and and if you feel so thankful, like thank you, God, for providing us, you know, this. And I, I've really, you know, had the chance to wean off of so much and flavors taste better. And if you talked a little bit about, you know, people in the secular world talking about the benefits of fasting, and and there are many. I mean, I've read about the mental benefits for anxiety or depression by, by fasting. If you look up the benefits of intermittent fasting, uh -huh. there are many. And if you look up abstinence as well, like it takes the liver roughly 40 days to cleanse itself. Uh -huh. So by not having alcohol, if we choose to do that as well, and eggs and other things, we are cleansing our liver. So it is really a whole body detox. It is a detox of mind, body, and spirit. So the Lenten fast is, is the badge of honor. And it's also the way to like totally rejuvenate ourselves and, and feel good and and get back to, I feel like, to the basics. You know, like you talked about good bread, good food, not processed food. Get back to what, you know, humanity was originally. Yes, yes. Break the habit of all that and get, get some good stuff in your body. And, exactly. You know, gonna, we'll put a podcast out later on about uh, penance. Because I'm going to, mm. we're going to try to do, put together the uh, night nocturnal adoration at the home during Lent. Mm. You can't okay, get to adoration at your chap at your parish. Do the Father Mateo idea of at at the home for all of Lent, along with all the fasting during it. You got the you got the P and the F already done. Now you just got to work on the alms giving. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and, I mean, I, I I wrote an article on like um, twenty or more different traditional Catholic charities to donate to. I mean, you can Google online great alms giving places. Another way too is like I wrote an article on five alternatives for coffee from Starbucks, Catholic coffee places. So, I mean, even though you're getting something, you're supporting the monastery. So there are, there are, you know, you might look at like jams or, or biscuits or like one of my favorite is biscotti. It comes from a monastery that I love. I got to order some more later today. So there's like things that we can be buying and why not buy it from religious orders, you know, and, and coffee is a great one. I, and there's over five I can, I can think of that, that offer that. So it goes to a good cause too. So our almsgiving doesn't necessarily always have to be giving to the poor, even though that is true almsgiving in itself. We can give to the church, we can give to pro-life causes, but we can also support um, monks and nuns and, and other orders that they need the support. So you can hand them money, but you can also support their operation too. So just something I think people can keep in mind as well as, you know, donating items. It's a great time of year that I, you know, with spring cleaning to take things out of your home, to box them up, to give them. Uh, I like to give them to the St. Vincent de Paul Society here because at least it has a Catholic name to it as opposed to a secular place or a commercial place. So um, I think about, there were some people that I heard about a long time ago, um, and they said that, you know, they would tell a story about they were very poor. They had a child and um, nobody would give them any money. There was no assistance. Their family wasn't helping them and they didn't have anywhere to turn. And they said that the one place that they went to, they gave them some money for food was Catholic Charities. And this was back in the 80s. Uh -huh. And they, they were not Catholic, but they became Catholic after that because they said the Catholics were the only people who cared about them. Everybody else, family or so, said, not my problem. We didn't tell you to have a child. You figure it out. I don't care about your employment situation. Catholic Charities gave them money. So the apostolic outreach, the mission we can do by supporting Catholic organizations. Like, for instance, you know, the Salvation Army is not Catholic. It is a Protestant denomination. I would never donate a dollar to them. You should not be donating a dollar to them. There are Catholic alternatives. And of course, there's better charities than others. We know that for how well they affirm the Catholic faith and its fullness and its tradition. But at least if it's a Catholic name, that's going to do more than a non-Catholic name. So just something to keep in mind. There's there's plenty of time set to adjacent to think about it, to pray about it. But I just hope I leave people with the idea that the Lenten fast that the average Catholic observes and, and Lenten abstinence 
is such a small minuscule remnant of what our forefathers joyously did as the tithes of the year. And if we can come up with just a small army observing that fast for the glory of God, I have no doubt that it's going to be immensely useful for souls. And one day, I'm sure that we will see in heaven the fruit of our labors. And those of us who are really observing it and doing it, of course, in the state of grace. So don't be in a state of mortal sin, do all this because it counts for nothing. Should have said that at the beginning. Everything we do must be in the state of grace. So go to confession often. That was a tradition on Fat Tuesday as well. Shrove Tuesday is what it was called because it was the day we would go to to confess. So but go to confession often if needed. Give it all the honor and glory to God that you can this Lent. And... You know, I'm sure we'll have our shortcomings. You know, some people say like, oh, I messed up today. I just couldn't. I I, I accidentally ate something. I, I had an extra snack. It's okay. Just keep going. It's okay. You didn't fall off the train. You're just a small bunk. Just keep going and offer it all up at Easter. I like how you said these yes. small army. Gideon only did it with 300. Mm -hmm. And if everyone knows the world's going to, you know what, in a handbasket and tweeting about it is not going to do anything, stuff like this when... The doors are closed. You and God only knows what's going on inside you. It's kind of like the idea I bring up about uh, the athlete running steps, stairs, when no one's there, the lights are off, putting in extra time. This is mm -hmm. you putting in the extra time for God to become better. And we don't need a million people doing it. just need a small minority help Absolutely. on yes, Absolutely. on changing the world. Yeah. And if you think about it, like if we, if we're not doing it, who is? Uh -huh. Because surely people watching this, maybe hopefully this is more devout people than normal. This is not your average Catholic. If you listening to this are not going to observe it, who is? You know, so if you're listening and you're thinking about it, I have no doubt you should be observing it to some extent because God calls us all to do more than the bare minimum. And this is surely the way we can do so. The Lenten fast is our badge of honor. Bingo on the bare minimum. No, yeah, don't be a minimalist. Yes. Yes. Matthew, appreciate it. I have all the links in the show notes. There's a Catholic Life, 1 Peter 5, the Catechetical Class, catechismclass.com. Again, he's everywhere. So check out the links underneath <laughs> in the show notes. And but not Wall Street week. Journal. I'm sorry? Not Wall Street Journal. What are you going to say today? <laughs> no, no, no. Not, definitely not the New York Post. <laughs> Matthew, appreciate it. We'll do it again all next time. All right. Thanks, Steve.